I came out of the place where we were staying today. Brother Brent, who's preaching to the boys and girls downstairs, he came in the other night. He has a dually, and if you know much about dualies and the snow and ice, those back ends of those dualies just go everywhere. And he slid off into the yard of a place, and we couldn't get him out. So this morning we got up early to dig him out, and I went out to help him. You know, I'm a good guy, going to go help my buddy get his truck out. And I stepped outside on that porch, and uh, five steps down, sheet of ice. I'm from Florida, clueless, <laughs> and uh, I'm glad my kids weren't there to make fun of me. Because uh, I went bouncing down the steps. I feel pretty good tonight. I'll, I'll feel it in the morning. And uh, I felt really stupid is what I felt. But uh, what, a, uh, what a blessed day, huh? We've had a good day. Good day yesterday. And uh, I'm just so excited what the Lord's doing for you all. And, and I sure appreciate Pastor and his heart for people and, and his family. We'd ever fel- fellowship with him a little bit and get to know some of you. And it's just a real privilege to serve you. Uh, if you're in your Bible tonight, you want to go to 1 Timothy 6, we'll get there. That's where we're going to be beginning in 1 Timothy 6 tonight. And uh, this is an important message. Tonight I want to, you know, if you remember yesterday morning we talked about it's easy to win. The Bible is so simple. Uh, a Christian home is the result of a, a Christian life. As I live for Jesus, then that spills over to affect my marriage and my children and all the things that go into that. And remember, there was nothing really deep yesterday, but it was really kind of brutal, wasn't it, when we stop and think about it? Because we talked about things like, you know, um, our tongues, and uh, boy, that's always a brutal one. And we talked about, um, about anger and about, you know, how easy it is to just be difficult, grouchy and irritable and, and uptight and, and, and angry and sharp-tongued and short-tempered and We just talk about all the basic things that if if I learn to grow in Christ, remember one of the things I was trying to show you yesterday was that as believers, we all come from different backgrounds. Uh, Some of us are farther along than others. How many of you have been saved a long time? Uh, But some of you, it's not very long. And some of you, all your life has been Christian. You don't remember a time you didn't know about Jesus. And for some of you, it's like you just met him. So we're all different. we got all different backgrounds. But here's one of the things I wanted every one of you to get. And that was that statement I kept saying, as you, as you and I learn the Word of God and we apply God's Word to our life. Remember that statement yesterday? What happens is I, as I apply God's Word to my life, the Spirit of God takes the Word of God, makes me more like Jesus, and the result of that is I can have the blessings of God. Now, nobody but us tonight, how many of you want the blessings of God in your life? Would that, be, would that be obvious? Well, of course. How many of you want the blessings of God in your marriage? How many of you are married? You want God's blessings, don't you? I mean, if you're going to be married, it might as well be a good one. I mean, right? For crying out loud. People will get on to me and my wife because we flirt. And sometimes people are like, oh, my word, you people act like newlyweds. And we're like, we are. We are in the 25th year now of our honeymoon. I have five kids, all honeymoon babies. Um, every one of them. And some people are like, oh my word for crying out loud, you guys act like you're, you guys act like you're newly married. Well, why not? If you're going to be married, you might as well be in love. You might as well flirt. She didn't fall in love with you because you were a jerk. <laughs> she fell in love because, with you because you were one sweet guy and you were, you know, you were flirty and you built her up and told her she was beautiful and he fell in love with you, not because you were hard to get along with and rolled your eyes and cited his jokes. He fell in love with you because you, uh, made it, you made him think that he, you just made him think he was the man. And he fell in love with you for that. And, and, and here, here's the whole thing. You and I just, you and I, if we're not careful, we get going through our life, we're connected to everything, and we, we miss the simplicity. It's easy to win. You just got to keep, you got to stay on the honeymoon. You're married, stay on the honeymoon. I mean, you got text, this, we're talking about connected. You got these things, use them to help your marriage. Flirt text. <laughs> I mean, be like, hey, baby doll, thinking about you. You better put your helmet on. I'm going to come home and kiss your brains out. I mean, uh, just, uh, I mean make, it, make it good. I have teenagers and my teenagers, you know how everybody is, if you see a text, you want to read it. It's like, I got to read it. I got, you know, what is it? I got to read it. Somebody texting me. And my teenagers will pick up my phone and read my text. And they'll pick up their phone and read their mom text. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to break them. <laughs> so I sent her a good one. I mean, I made it really good. And my kids are like, Mom, Dad, Dad texted you, Mom. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and they're like, you, got, you, you, you guys, 
you guys do that? And they're like, yeah, how'd you think you got here? Because we play chess? You know what I mean? For crying out loud, we're married. This is normal. And see, here's the whole point, ladies and gentlemen. The whole point is that you and I are living in a world that is so distracted and so busy and so disconnected that we're missing the simplicity. And yet you are a child of God. You have the Word of God. Get the Word of God into your life. Are you dealing with your issues? Did you get that? Yesterday I had you all look at each other and say, you know, you got issues. And boy, it's the truth, because you do. We all do. What's yours? What's your issue? Do you even know? Would there be, I mean, if I ask your spouse, what's his issue? Reckon she could tell me? What's her issue? Reckon she would have an idea? Well, you say, well, I don't know if I have any issues or not. Well, then ask her. Go out to a really nice restaurant. I mean, go spend 100 bucks on a meal and, and sit in a dark restaurant with candles and dress up. Go out and dress up and put on cologne and wear deodorant and, and, um, <laughs> and say to her, you know, honey, what do you think I could work on that would make our marriage happier for you? And she may say, uh, you know, honey, you're kind of harsh. And don't defend it. Don't be like, well, you just don't know how hard I work. And I have to put up with you. You know, don't ruin it. This is a time to go, okay. Tell you what, I'll work on that. And I go get God's word. And I ask God to direct me to text that I can learn. And I memorize the Bible and I meditate on it because God's Word is alive. And I ask the Holy Spirit to take the Word of God and mature me and grow me and I start becoming like Jesus. You know, when you're becoming like Jesus, you're driving along and, and you know, people drive so crazy. And you're driving along and somebody just cuts you off. You're like, Jesus, here's, here's your life. You're like, oh, go, come on in. Maybe their wife's having a baby. Come on. Dude, they're in a hurry. You must be late for work. Come on in. Yeah, you can come on in. See, there's no bother. Your wife, your wife, um, your wife says something that kind of rubs you the wrong way. But if you're growing in Christ, you're like, oh, she must be having a bad day. Honey, are you okay? Can I do something to help you today? What can I do? I, you know, I, I can tell you're having a rough day. Is there some way I could help you today? Instead of being like, oh my word, she's not hard at work. And what's 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 Isn't that how people talk to each other? I was on an airplane not long ago, Southwest Airlines. We landed. Everybody's trying to get off this baby. Everybody's lined up, ready to just get off here. We got to go, we got to go, we got to go. Everybody's in line. We're all getting off this plane. There was an older lady, and she had a cane, and she could barely walk. And there, normally, you know, people like that will often wait till the end. But her husband was with her, and he was impatient. He's ready to go. So he jumps up. He's like, come on, honey. So I was like two behind them. So it was a lady in front of me, and then he gets up, and he's pulling down luggage, and she, she, she was caught off guard. Her purse wasn't ready, and she didn't have her cane quite ready, and she's trying to, you know, to get around. She's on the inside, and she's trying to get out, and he got really upset. It was an older couple, and he just kind of, he was rude. He was like, well, for crying out loud, it takes you, every, it takes you forever to do anything today. He said, I'm just going to get off. You get off when you can. And he stopped off, and I was so bothered. I was like, give me that cane. Sweetheart, when I get up there, I will hit him for you in the name of Jesus, and I'll bring you the cane back. <laughs> and here's what was the most amazing thing in the world. She was not bothered at all. She smiled at us, and she said, um, you know, sometimes, she said this so sweetly, sometimes my husband is so, he gets so impatient. She said, we've been married for years, and sometimes he gets so impatient. And she said it so sweetly. She wasn't bothered by his irkness. You see, that's what Christianity is about. Christianity is about me and you taking the word of God and becoming more like Jesus. I can't say that to you enough. Come to every service and bring your Bible and sit on the end of your seat. And as pastors teaching the word of God, write it down and take notes and go, you know, I need that. And don't be like, Rick, he's been living in my house this week. I mean, we all do that sometimes. Like, whoa, he's been reading my mail. I mean, I think he's connected to my Facebook messenger. He's listening in. But it's not that it's God speaking to your heart. So receive the word of God and learn the word of God, become more like Jesus, and the result is you'll have God's blessings in your life. And it's worth having. And you've got to teach your children to live that kind of life. How many of you know that children, just by nature, can be selfish, irritable, fuss at each other, uh, get angry at each other? 
Well, teach them the Word of God so that your boys and girls can learn how to treat each other. I mean, we, we never let our children fight. You, you don't fight. You do not fight with each other in my house. That is your sibling. You are loyal to each other. You love each other. Now, I'm not saying they never did, but we always stopped it. And you know, sometimes you know, you're going to sit on the couch and hold hands and pray for an hour. Yes, I know you're 15 and 16, but this will be good for you. But, but the point is, the, the, point, the point is, you got to train your children and yourself. And so I talked to you about it's easy to win. Last night, we talked about where do we begin? And we went back to the Word of God again and said, okay, Lord, we've got to be honest. Paul tells us that I need, to, I need to make sure I'm not living the way the world lives. I need to live the way a Christian ought to live. So I've got to be honest. I've got to deal with that, make sure I'm honest. And I've got to make sure I have no anger in my life. And I've got to make sure that I edify. You remember that illustration? Remember, and I asked for a knife, remember that? Uh, my brother, tell me your name again, my brother. Tim. Uh, Tim uh, watched us online last night, and uh, Tim said, I wish I'd have been here because I'd have given you this one. Show him, Tim, would you? Nobody was, look at this. Tim said, I wish I'd have been here last night. I had a knife for you. How's that right there? <laughs> it's like, wow, that would have been a good illustration last night, wouldn't it? I was in Michigan, I gave that illustration, and, and I said, has anybody got a knife in the room? And this teenage boy came running down, it was a big church, came running down the side up onto the platform. He said, I got one, he gave me this little pocket knife. And I said, for crying out loud, son, I was just being goofy. I said, for crying out loud, son, is that the only knife you got? And he was like, oh, no. He said, I got this one, and I got uh, this one, and I got um, this one. And the, the kid, had, they're getting bigger every time. And I was like, boy, this is redneck Michigan right here, let me just tell you. And, and so here, here's the whole point. I gotta, I gotta grow because that's where I begin. Now here's what you may be thinking. I've never seen a Christian home. Okay, it's okay. But you have a Bible. And God is able to start where you are. Maybe, maybe you've had an anger issue all your life. You can get the Word of God in your life and you can start growing in the Lord and you can become the sweetest, unbothered, easiest to get along with person in the world. You can't do it on your own, but you have a Bible, and you have the Holy Spirit, and that'll affect your family and your marriage and your entire life. You say, well, I just tell it like it is. That's my spiritual gift, sarcasm. Well, sarcasm isn't wrong. You know that. But when sarcasm is damaging your marriage and your children, then it's certainly unwise. And sometimes I need to back off and be sincere. You ever been around a couple where everything they say about each other is negative and funny? Bethany and I decided many years ago, no. Everything we say about each other is going to be positive. So when we're in, we're in public, we just tell each other, we tell other people how wonderful we are. I'll say, you know, she's the most amazing girl I've ever met in my life. This is my beautiful Bethley Joy, the love of my life, my best friend. And she'll say, oh, this is my man. She calls me handsome hunk of man. You can call me Dave. <laughs> she does. It's just going to be, hey, handsome, hungry man. And we, 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 we just try to have a sweet spirit. But see, that's not natural. The world you live in, everybody's uptight, everybody's bothered, everybody gets offended. Uh, you're, a ch you're, you're a child of God. And so I, that's where you begin. Now, tonight, we're going to deal with a different issue. We've got 30 minutes. And tonight, uh, let's, uh, let's deal with a different issue. Tonight, I want to talk to you on the subject, it's easy to sin, the issue of entertainment. How many of you like entertainment? Do you? I like entertainment. I do. I, I do. Let me read you some verses here that are just great. For, uh, second, uh, first Timothy chapter one. Uh, I'm sorry. Second, no. First Timothy chapter six. First Timothy chapter six. I want you to look at verses six and seven to get us started. And, and if this doesn't describe our our culture, this is amazing to me that this was written 1900 years ago. But godliness with contentment is great gain, he says. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now, how many of you agree with that? We're not going to take it with us. I mean, you've all heard all the jokes about that probably, or the stories. I heard about one guy, he was a multimillionaire, he died. Somebody went to the funeral and said to one of his sons, how much did your dad leave behind? And the son said, all of it. And that's a silly thing to almost say, but it's the truth. We've got, we got a lot, and we're not taking it with us. So he says in the next verse, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And look at, the, look at these next two verses. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith. Our blessings 
can cause us to err from the faith, can damage us spiritually. Go down a few more verses and look and please at verse 17. Verse 17 and 18. Charge them that are rich in this world. How many of you here tonight are aware of the fact that in a very technical sense, he's talking to me and you? Charge them that are rich in this world. Did you know that in a technical sense, based on the world, you and I are pretty wealthy? You have a car? Then you're in the top 5% of the world. Do you have a house with air conditioning and heat and running water? Top 5% of the world. Where Micah preaches in India, the average person in India doesn't own a car and never will. Uh, Micah stayed in the Himalayans earlier uh, or, or late last fall, and in the Himalayans it was bitterly cold and not one place he stayed had indoor heat. Not one. It was bitterly cold. You got heat in your house tonight? You're top five. You got money in your pocket? Money in the bank? You're top five. So here's a weird thing for me and you to think, because here's what we tend to think. And I'm just barely surviving in my four-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath, two-car garage house with running water and flushable toilets and three meals a day and food in the refrigerator. You and I can take that for granted. So here's what I'm trying to say. Paul's writing to us especially. And he says, charge them that are rich in this world, verse 17, that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. And I love this next phrase at the end of verse 17. Trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to do what? To enjoy. There's entertainment. Are, are 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 you aware of the fact that God created entertainment? Are you aware of that? He did. That's why he gives you children. I mean, honestly, aren't children entertaining? Like like, uh, uh, one of the brothers here in the church, uh, it's your little boy. His little boy came in last night here in the auditorium. What's his name? Paxton? Paxton came in. Have you seen Paxton crawl? Hudson. Hudson. All right, it's Hudson. Have you seen that? He doesn't crawl like most babies, but he can sit on his rear end, and he can move through this faster than some of you can run. And I'm like, dude, that's entertaining. Put that kid down. What in the world? You don't, need, you don't need television or the internet. Get his baby. <laughs> and you'll be like, wow. See, God created. You ever, you, ever, you, ever, you, know, you ever been around animals? Animals are entertaining, aren't they? You have a dog? If you have a dog, it's entertaining. You know, I saw a meme. See if I can get this. I saw a meme the other day that said, I, I, I was watching my dog chase its tail and thinking, boy, dogs are so dumb. And then I thought, but I'm watching my dog chase its tail for entertainment. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it's kind of funny, isn't it? And you, you got a cat. I mean, I, I, always loved, we, 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 I had a puppy. My, my dog's in, you know, gone now. She died last year of, of kidney failure. My golden retriever, Gracie. And when Gracie was a puppy, we had so much fun because we had, a, uh, we had uh, one of those, you know, little, what do you call it, the laser beam, little laser pointers. And I'd take, I'd take my dog outside at, at night. And that dog would spend hours chasing that laser beam. Zoom. And, and I'd do it in circles, so I'd go in circles. And, and uh, that's just entertainment. God created entertainment. And Americans are almost drunk on entertainment. We really are. We, are, we, we really are. I, I, um, I, I would say to you that entertainment is expensive. I read this. Uh, I looked up on the Internet. That's how I know it's true. Um, <laughs> these, are, these are statistics I found on the Internet. Uh, the average uh, Americans on average, rather, Americans on average spend $10.7 trillion every year shopping. That's hard to think about. Um, pretzels in the United States of America, you know how much we spend on pretzels every year? $550 million on pretzels. Uh, pets, our pets cost us $50.96 billion. Romance novels alone cost $10 billion a year. Americans spend $34.6 billion a year on gambling. This one kind of made me chuckle. Tattoos cost $2.3 billion, and tattoo removal, $66 million. <laughs> I thought that's kind of funny. Uh, golf balls, $500 million a year on golf balls in the United States. Taxidermy, 
which gets into the hunting and fishing. Taxidermy, $800 million a year. Video games, $17 billion a year. Professional sports, $25.4 billion a year. Ringtones, are you ready for this? Ringtones, $5 billion a year so that your phone will play a cool song. Come on, is that not like, are you kidding me? See, we, we love entertainment. I preach to teenagers all the time. And I can say this in any teen group anywhere in the country, and they explode with laughter. I'll say to teenagers, I know what you do on YouTube. You watch videos of old people falling down. And teens are like, yeah, we do, you know. Ha, ha. And it's, it's just entertainment. We love it. And we're surrounded by it. We're just, it's everywhere. But here's what I want you to know in the Bible. It was God's idea. God created entertainment. It was his design. It, it, was, it, de it was derived with God. So here we are talking in a, in a family conference this week about connectivity. We're connected and all the issues of connectivity. You know what? These are, these are a gift from God. Really, God created the enjoyment of life. When you can laugh, I, I'm a dad. I absolutely love dad jokes. I mean, I do. I, I, got, I got hundreds of them. I collect them. I, when I speak in Christian schools, I do stand-up comedy for five minutes every chapel to get the kids on my side. I, I'm a farm boy by trade. I love cow jokes. You know a bunch of them, don't you? You know, what do you call a cow with no legs? Ground beef. What do you call a cow with no front legs? Lean beef. What do you call the cow was the, that was knighted by the Queen of England? Sirloin. Come on, it just heard more than a chuckle. Those are pretty good. They're pretty moving, aren't they? <laughs> oh, my word. You, you, know, you know what you call a cow that no longer gives milk? A milk dud. <laughs> I, I got a ton of them. I, one of my favorite stories is about a farmer. He was milking his cow, and, and he's on his little three-legged stool. Every morning, every night, he's milked that cow by hand for years. And he just he can do it in his sleep. He's sitting on his stool. He's milking his cow. He's you know, look, looking around while he's milking the cow. And he, he glanced up alongside the cow's body, and he saw this huge fly. And it's circling the cow's head, and it's circling. And it's getting faster and faster. And all of a sudden, boom, it went in the cow's ear. Boom, never came back out. He's milking, and he's thinking, wow, I wonder where that fly went to. He's watching, and the fly never came back out, and all of a sudden, he's milking away, and the fly just plopped right out of the milk bucket. And he was like, wow, that's like in one ear and out the other. <laughs> Aren't you glad you wasted a Monday night to come to church to hear these? But see, here's the whole point. Do you know that laughter's a gift from God? Entertainment's a gift from God? God doesn't, God doesn't want us to walk out of a family conference talking about entertainment and, and all of this. He'll be like, I'm telling you right now, we will never laugh again. We are Baptists. <laughs> the Son of God. Uh, the God, God, God the, the Bible tells us that, that there was joy. All, it's all over the Bible, joy. And God gives us nature so we can enjoy it. This is all part of God's design. But there's dangers in it. That's the second thing i got to talk to you about. God designed it, but there are dangers in it. How many of you are aware of the fact that there are dangers in entertainment. Are you aware of that? I, I, I can give you four right away. I, I think we're going to put them on the screen for you. Here's the first one, excess. How many of you agree that sometimes you can waste a lot of hours accomplishing nothing? Excess. You that have children, you got to be on guard about that. Because if our children do not know how to work, make their bed, do arithmetic, read a book, if our daughters leave the house and can't cook because we've never taught them, nobody knows how to write, nobody knows how to have respect, because we've spent hours and hours and hours and hours. Escape. That's another one. That's a danger in entertainment. Some of you, watch this, some of you struggle with that. Because you know why Facebook is so important in your life? It's an escape from negative emotions that you're feeling. That's why you go to it all the time. That's why some people are always, always like this. I, I watch families that, I'll go to Cracker Barrel or, or Olive Garden or somewhere, and I'll watch an entire family sit at a table, mom and dad, and everybody does this. Nobody, talk. we watch one family, our family, you know, we, we love to watch people, and our family's like, let's watch them, let's see how long it takes them to say something. And not one time in a meal did the husband speak to the wife, 
or the wife speak to the husband, or the parents speak to the kids, or the kids speak to the parents. The entire meal, the entire family said, you know what that's called? Escape. They're escaping from the responsibilities. They're escaping from the relationship responsibilities. That's, that's escape. And, and some, of you, some of you have some legitimate issues in your heart. Maybe there's bitterness or there's resentment. Maybe there's pain. But you know what? When you use entertainment to escape from the pain, you know, all you're doing is medicating it but not overcoming it. You don't overcome pain by escaping it. You don't overcome the failures and problems of life by escaping it. You've got to learn how to take steps to overcome it and deal with it biblically. And entertainment is turning into excess. That's a danger. Escape, that's a danger. There's a bigger word too, and it's error. Error is a major danger. Uh, how much would we have to talk about just the issues of pornography on the internet? The incredible error. Moms and dads, if you are not aware of how easily your children can see garbage, please do the research. You know, the average age of first exposure to internet pornography is 11. And I will tell you what happens to a child who sees it at the age of 11 or earlier. There's nothing perverted in their mind. But what it does at that stage is it peaks massive curiosity and massive fear. They know something's not right there. Something in their mind says, this isn't, this isn't right, this isn't good, something's wrong. But the fear prevents them from dealing with it. The fear turns to silence. Here's what a kid, here's what a kid thinks. If a kid is nine years old and sees something on the phone or the iPad or the computer or the, the TV and, and, it, and, it, and it's pornographic, here's what happens. They, they feel all these negative emotions. There's fear and there's uncertainty. They don't even have the vocabulary to tell you what they saw. They know that it's, that doesn't feel right and there's something wrong there and I know it's wrong, but how are they going to tell you what it is? They don't know how. And, and, and then there's that fear of what if I say it and, and it's wrong and, and it was my fault and I'm going to get in trouble. So the way we handle that when you're a child is with silence. But the second part of that is Curiosity. Not only do they have that fear and uncertainty and the inability to communicate it, now there is a curiosity. Wonder what that was about. I'm counseling a young man, and uh, I met him when he was 14 years old, and, and he came for counseling, and I knew something huge was going on. And when he finally, we finally pulled out of him what the issue was, what we found out was that his parents had gotten satellite TV in their house, with no blockages, it was completely open. And the little boy, when he was four, found somewhere in the upper echelons of the hundreds of, he found homosexual porn at four. He doesn't know what that is. So he didn't tell anybody because it felt wrong. So now it's silence, it's a secret, but it's also a curiosity. So for the next 10 years, he periodically went back. When he was 14 years old, he comes to see me, and the question of his heart is this, am I gay? He's 14. Where did that come from? An error of entertainment. Now, anybody can accidentally stumble on it. It wasn't that kid's fault. That was... That was, we permitted an error. That was a mom and daddy fault. An error was permitted. He's supposed to be protected from that. I'll tell you what I would never do. I would never go down to an adult bookstore and buy 15 adult magazines and take it to my son's room and put it on the dresser and say, now son, don't look at this. But how often in our generation do moms and dads buy this and this and hand it to our children? and say, don't look, or sometimes aren't even aware that they could. And what's happening in our generation is the Christian family, and, and I, wish I, I wish I could tell you Christian families are exempt. They don't deal with this. I only counsel young people from Christian families, and you would be surprised. The stats are not on our side. Average age of first exposure is 11. The number one age group that looks at the garbage called pornography on the internet, they are 12 to 17 years old. 
Did you know that every minute, I'm sorry, every second in the United States of America, every second, every second, $3,000 is spent on the internet on pornography in the United States. Watch this, $3,000, $6,000, $9,000, $12,000, $15,000, $18,000, $21,000, $24,000, $27,000, $30,000, $33,000, $36,000, $39,000, and it never stops any second of the day. It's startling. I'm here to tell you, moms and dads and ladies and gentlemen, we have to win. We have to. Because entertainment is not just about escape and excess and error. It can be our enemy. It can damage your marriage. It can damage your children. And you know what? What we find is that a young man who is four years old or five years old or nine years old or 12 years old or 13 years old and through entertainment began to struggle with issues that nobody should struggle with, the danger is they'll carry it the rest of their life. They'll have to deal with it forever. Take a miracle. Now, I'm glad to tell you God is a miracle-working God. I know people that were head over heels addicted and even in debt. But thank God through the efforts of memorizing God's word and applying God's word to their life over a process of time are free. Now, they always have to be careful. I have a friend who will not own a smartphone because he was so addicted he can't. To see a smartphone reminds him of the garbage of his past, so he can't have a smartphone. And the only time he can use the internet is an absolute full view public. Anything he does, he does it with somebody else in the room looking over his shoulder. And, and you know, we, we need entertainment. It's fine. It's good. But it can be very dangerous. Are y'all with me so far? That's a little heavy. And I'm sorry it's a little heavy. But you've got to know this is a massive issue facing your life and your marriage and your family. And God wants you to win. So let's have some directions for using entertainment from the Bible. All right, here's some directions concerning entertainment. I have six of them in just a few moments. I'm going to give them to you and go back and and talk about them. Here's some direction for our entertainment. We should seek God's will. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, moms and dads, if you're not careful, what you do is you say, well, you know what? Um, I think it'd be cool if my kid had a TV in their bedroom connected to the satellite. Okay, maybe it is. But when's the last time you thought, should God, should I allow my kid to have a TV in their bedroom? God, should I buy my son an iPad? Are you even ever aware of God's will? God, should we watch this movie? Should we? God, is, is, uh, is this okay with you? The Bible says in Ephesians 5 verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, Um, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I'm to be wise. I'm to seek God's will. I'm to say, God, what do you want from me about entertainment? Uh, The the, the issue today is people will say, uh, okay, okay, here's an app, and everybody's, this is a cool app, let's all get this app. But do I ever stop and say, God, is this the best thing for me? Should I have a Facebook account or should I have a Twitter account? I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm asking, have you ever thought about God's will? Have you ever said, God, what should I do? Let's start there. How can I control my entertainment? Start by asking God what you should do. You know what teenagers do to me all the time? Teenagers love to come to me in a youth camp, and they'll say this. They'll say, Brother Dave, let me talk to you. Yes, sir. What can I do for you, son? He'll say, Brother Dave, what do you think about such and such? And it might be a rock band. Uh, It might be a, a TV video game a TV show, a video game. What do you think about this? And there was a time, there was a time that I spent hours, Pastor Matt, trying to have all the answers. I knew every video game, all the positives and negatives. I knew, I tried to know all the latest, coolest, you know, singing groups. Um, uh, I, I quit a number of years ago. The last singing group I did any research on and said, I can't keep up with it was the band called Red Hot Chili Peppers. That dates me big time because that's been a few years ago. And I, I can't keep up with this. I, I don't have time to find all the latest video games. And, and, and I started saying, how do I help young people? So teens will come to me and they'll go, what do you think about? And here's what I do. Every time I say, can I ask you a question? Sure. Have you asked God? 
They're like, excuse me? Why are you asking me? Have you asked God? Aren't you a Christian? Pastor, you and I have a mutual friend that came to me one day, and he said, uh, Brother Dave, I want to ask you a question. He said, uh, I have always worn a tie when I preach. And I'm thinking about not wearing ties anymore. And he goes like this, so what do you think about that? (laughs) And I said, why are you asking me? Have you asked God? He said, come on, brother, that's kind of silly. No, it's not. Why does it matter what I think about what he wears in the pulpit? I mean, I don't care if he wants to wear a tuxedo. I don't care if he wants to wear Bermuda shorts. Well, I do care about that because... I've seen his legs before, and that would blind the entire audience. Now, this is being silly tonight, but you know the answer to my brother was? Don't ask me. You're a Christian. You have a Bible. Ask God what he would have you to do. Because if God leads you to do it, then you have peace about it. doesn't matter what Dave Young thinks. Because one thing I found about churches is that everybody has opinions. So we've got to follow God. Because God has a plan for your church, just like he has a plan for my church, just like he has a plan for Brother Tracy's church. We're, we're, God has a plan. He knows, he knows the people Brother Tracy's trying to reach and the people Pastor's trying to reach. He knows that we're all different and what God may want Pastor to do, he may not want Brother Tracy to do. And, and that's why sometimes in a church you'll have one church and, and, and they are, they're totally different. You'll go to one church and everybody's like, amazing grace. And you go to the next, you're like, amazing grace. Well, how can you have two totally different? Well, the fact is, are we following God? So your teenager comes to me, why am I going to live? Is this okay to listen? I, don't ask me. Say, God, I want to know in our family what kind of entertainment we ought to have and how we should limit things. And God, you lead us and we'll follow. Seek God's will. Number two, seek wisdom. How does the Bible say we get wisdom? If any man lacks wisdom, let him do what? Ask of God. Have you ever said, Lord, uh, I want to be careful to protect my children. You've got to give me wisdom. You ought to pray about it. Here's number three. Seek beauty and excellence. Seek beauty. Seek excellence. Um, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 10 says, we're to approve things that are excellent. Um, some things are funny, but they're not excellent. I'm trying to teach my children. Not everything on YouTube that you laugh at is appropriate. There's no beauty in it. There's nothing excellent about it. It's rude, it's unkind, it's, it, it's demeaning, it's, it, it, it treats people ungraciously. I need to have, ex- I'm a child of God. I need to seek contentment in my life. When you watch television, uh, give me that next screen there. When you, when you seek contentment, when you're watching television, and all of a sudden you're like, man, I just, I just, um, I just don't have a body like that, and, and, and I'm, I'm too skinny, or I'm, I'm too heavy, or, or I don't like my hair, or, or I, don't like my, I don't like my eyelashes, and I, I don't like my fingernails, and, and, uh, and, I, and I wish I had bigger biceps. And, and, and all of a sudden you're like, woe is me, and life is just been, and I will never measure up. And we get so down. The Bible says if you have food and raiment, be content. You don't need a new car. Did you? You, don't have to, you don't need a new car. You know what I know about new cars? I don't care how cool your car is. I don't care how new your car is. Mark this down in black and underline it in red. Your car will get old very soon. It's the truth. Buy the coolest car in the world with the latest gadgets, and one year from now, it will no longer be cool. So go to Walmart and go to the automotive section, and they sell this thing in there called New Car Smell. Buy it and soak your car. And say, smell that? Man, we got a new car. Put a wax job on that baby you got and be content. Don't go head over heels in debt and because you've been watching something online that's made you unhappy. You, you, you be content. Seek industriousness. That's our next one. Does your child know how to work? Or can your child only play video games. You know what I've discovered? My kids basically only do what I expect of them. A dad said to Brother Self, Brother Micah Self, a few weeks ago, a few months ago now, he said, uh, this is way back in September, I guess, because right after the summer ended, he said, um, my teenage son, I hope you can help him this week. 
And Micah said, oh yeah, what's, what's up with your teenage son? He said the only thing he did this summer was play video games. Now Micah's single, has no kids of his own, and is an evangelist. And sometimes evangelists don't think. <laughs> so the dad said to Micah, all my kid did this summer was play video games. I hope you can help him. And Micah said, well, I got to tell you, Dad, it's not his fault. <laughs> Dad's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you're the dad. Why'd you let him play video games all summer? That's a good question. Put that video game on Craigslist for free. <laughs> he won't have a video game to play anymore. Now, see, this is kind of dumb, isn't it? But the fact of the matter is, do your, do your sons know how to work? I had a tire go flat on my van some months ago, and I went and had it repaired. And the guy at the car dealership or the tire shop, he said, uh, pull your vehicle around here, I'll put that tire on for you. And I said, oh, no, I'll take it, I'll take it. He said, well, let me put it on for you. And I said, no. He said, you don't want me to put the tire on for you? I said, no, I have a teenager. He doesn't know how to do this yet. So I drove that van back to where we were staying and said, hey, son, get your work clothes on. Come out here. And this is where you find the jack. And this is how somebody who apparently has never done this before designed it. Right. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> like, you're down here and you're like, <laughs> nobody's ever used one of these before. Whoever designed this silly thing. And, but I showed him how to use it, and we got the van up and pulled the lug nuts off, and he put a tire on, and he got dirty doing it. And I was like, you know, give me, give me Knuckles, son, because you just did a man's job. And my like, my 14-year-old son is like, well, you know, yes, I did. Because <laughs> that's just how, that's how God designed us. I went to Walmart one time, and you ever seen, they were advertising some video game at Walmart, and, and the, here was the slogan, achieve greatness. <laughs> playing video games i mean is that how you get great in our society i defeated the next level of tekken or whatever i know how to floss now well that'll sure get you through life won't it now see the point is don't miss my first point god designed entertainment but if you're not careful, you never pray about it, you never seek for wisdom, you're not content, you don't look for things that are beautiful and excellent, and you're not industrious, and there's a bigger one. I'm to seek purity. I've got to make sure my internet on this phone is protected by a program called Covenant Eyes. And, and to get on the internet on this phone, I have to log in with my, my, my thumbprint, and, and if I want to see my Facebook and my Twitter... I have to go to the little covenant eyes emblem down here and I open it and that's how I connect to Facebook. Everything on the internet on my phone goes through covenant eyes and every three days my wife gets a report of what I looked at on the internet. And Brother Self gets that report because he's part of my ministry. I ask him to put this on his phone and although I'm 48 and he's 19, I mean 29... <laughs> Although I'm 48 and he's 29, I thought, you know what? If he's going to be accountable to me in, in the way of being open and, and vulnerable, you can see mine. I have an accountability partner. My best friend from college, Carrie Copeland, gets my report. And we connect all the time on what I've seen on the Internet. Now, why? Because I'm seeking purity. You know why? Because I know how easy it is to fail. And a lot of you are raising little ones. Moms and dads, if you've got them playing on your phone, it better be protected. My daughter works in a very large church in California, and there's a lady in the church, and she and her husband were talking to my daughter recently, got a three-year-old that's pretty, she's a little more advanced than some three-year-old. And the other day at their house, a box showed up. And they went, and they were like, did you order something? I don't know, did you order something? <laughs> And they open it, and the little three-year-old, there's a toy. And the little three-year-old, she's like, mine, it's mine. And they were like, how did you get this? And she said, on the phone, a three-year-old went on Amazon Prime. Apparently, it was a buy now, one click. She bought herself a pretty nice toy. 
with daddy's credit card. Now, you know, that's kind of funny. But you know what would not be funny? If that same three-year-old is on the internet because we don't have it properly filtered and see something that could damage her the rest of her life. You and I have got to seek purity. Guard your heart, the Bible says. I'll close. It's 8 o'clock. Some practical advice, okay? Uh, here's number one. Take a break. Just consider taking a break. Like this. Uh, maybe one hour a day, turn your phone off. No phone for an hour. Take a break. One hour a day, one day a month, one week a year. God designs you to rest. You know what nudges are? You know what, you know what I mean by nudges? How many of you get notifications on your phone? You know what a notification is? It's a nudge. It's a nudge. Pastor and I were out eating today, and, uh, and both of our phones would light up. Now, he never looked at it, but I noticed that his phone lit up several times while we were talking. The phone lights up. He got a notification. You know what that is? That's a nudge. You know what it says? Pick me up. Read me. Listen to me. It's a nudge. You know what? You and I are controlled by the nudges of the entertainment industries of our day. And it's no wonder we're so uptight. Take a break. Turn off the notifications. Just turn them off. I, I've turned mine off. There's a couple I leave on. I leave on texting for the sake of my children and my wife. I even set my wife and children a special sound that is only theirs. And I only look at the phone and answer it if it's my wife or my children. Other than that, it can wait. Turn off the notifications. Take control. Take control. Here's a little saying. Make sure that your connectivity goes to bed before you do. And you get up before it does. Make sure it goes to bed before you do. I've started a little something that's really helped me. I've started taking my phone at night about 9 o'clock and taking it to the bedroom and turning it on silent and plugging it in and leaving it in there while I go back to the living room and talk to the kids and we do homework and read a book together and sometimes watch something on TV. We don't have a TV. We just unplugged it because to us... It wasn't helping our family. The Bible doesn't say thou shaltest not as having us a televisionist. <laughs> so it's not that we thought it was something spiritual. We just thought, you know what? It's not helping us. So we can do without it. We, we, we watch some things. We still own one, but we rarely ever, and we even put it in a cabinet so you can't see it. That's just, that's our, we're trying to take control of our internet and our, entertainment we're trying to take control by taking the phone into the bedroom and just turning it off and and you know because when i found out i was doing it at night at night i was just mindlessly scrolling through twitter finding out what every preacher thinks about everybody else and <laughs> and going to bed with angst in my heart like you believe you said that my blood pressure was up and it's like i can't live this way so I'll turn it on there's even this thing you can buy it you can buy it at walmart or target or walgreens it's called an alarm clock. <laughs> and it's this really cool thing. It's like, it's like a real clock. And you can plug it in and set it. And it like in the morning, it beeps to wake you up. It's a really cool thing. You can buy some that flash lights at you to wake you up. Uh, I've always thought it'd be cool to invent one that slaps you to wake you up. <laughs> but you can, but see, the thing is, we are so connected that the internet controls us rather than we control it. This is such a blessing. I uh, do all my banking on here, right here. I am um, Marco Polo, my son and daughter, and when they're in California, face to face. I FaceTime my children. What a blessing. I record receipts by taking a photo of them. Automatically puts it where it's supposed to be. I find churches by going, take me to City Light Baptist. And my phone goes, turn left. 
turn right, turn right. And I've kind of gotten bad. If it says do it, I do it. <laughs> One of these days, it's going to play. If they, somebody started putting an algorithm, let's have a little fun. You know, turn left, and I wind up in a lake somewhere. Like, <laughs> how did I get here? But you know if it said it, we're going to do it. These are, this is incredible. But take control. And here's my last thing to tell you, and we're done tonight. Think ahead. Think ahead, ladies and gentlemen. God's given you a home. Some of you aren't married and, and, and you're single. Well, think ahead. Control the <coughs> entertainment of your life. Don't let it control you. Mommies and daddies, control the entertainment. Some of you daddies, you love video games, but don't let it control your life. You control it. Dad, if you've never taught your son anything, but you play video games two or three hours a day, you're controlled. It's in control, not you. God wants me and you to win. Turn the TV on only on purpose. Think ahead. Don't just have it on just because. Turn it on on purpose. I need to watch the news. I, I don't recommend it, but some people like the news. You know the five leading causes of depression in America? NBC, CBS, <laughs> CNN, FOX, ABC. I mean, it's the truth. But wait, some of you like that, but think ahead. Don't just say, oh, I'm home from work and I need to veg. And you sit on the couch for four hours and watch mindless. And you don't talk to your spouse and you don't talk to your children. See, it's not wrong to have entertainment. How many of you remember what I said? God designed entertainment. And it is a blessing, isn't it? Don't you love to laugh? Aren't you thankful that we are so blessed we can laugh? Uh, it's part of our lives. It's not going anywhere. If you buy a new car... It's going to be in your car. I got a screen in my car that says, this is how you back up. Shows me how to back up. Got little arrows. And yesterday I rolled my window down and looked out because I was back into the snow and Brother Self made fun of me. He was like, you know you have a screen, don't you? And Brother Brent was in the back seat and he goes, yeah, he's old school. <laughs> I guess I am a little bit. I can actually back with looking at mirrors instead of a screen. I'm a little old school. I admit it. I admit it. And, and, and I'm okay with that. I am getting older. I know I'm getting older. And uh, I look pretty good in spite of that. But, um, but here's the point. It's easy to sin. And this is a great night to go home and think about your entertainment. You have a wonderful family potential. You do. Take control of it. Use it to your advantage don't let it use you and fall in love with each other and talk with each other. You know why we unplugged that television? Just because we found out the TV was on, we didn't have conversations. So every night now, our family goes home, and we're not always home, but when we are, we go to the kitchen while mom cooks, and we turn on our playlist on Spotify, and sometimes it's happy, and sometimes it's just background music, and sometimes it's songs that we sing, silly songs or whatever. Sometimes we'll listen to maybe an oldie song that's not an evil thing, and we'll just laugh about it. We'll laugh, sometimes we'll sing together. You know, my kids, had, I'm going to get in trouble for this probably, but sometimes the kids and I will sing uh, Under the Boardwalk. Under the Boardwalk. And, and it's a dumb song. I don't even know if it's a bad song or not, but we just think it's funny. <laughs> and we'll all sing it. We'll all scoof around the kitchen. Then we go to the table. We have prayer, and we sing a song and have prayer. And we sit down at the table together. And we have a rule at the table. No phones. We sit at the table and eat a meal together. And we talk. And we laugh. And in the midst of talking and laughing, sometimes you teach. Because an issue comes up and you're like, well, you know, here's what the Bible says. And this is why we do this. And we stand for mom. So I'm teaching the boys to be gentlemen. So when mom comes to the table, I get her chair. The boys all stand and I seat her. We just talk. When the meal is over, if we're home, this is our deal as the boys, the men of our family. There's four of us. If you count me as, as one of the crew, we clean up the kitchen. So we say to mom, all right, you go get a bath, you go chillax, and me and the boys got the kitchen. And here's what me and the boys do. 
looking at the kitchen because we have fun. We do. My one son discovered several months ago that you can take the spray nozzle and rubber band it. And when you come in and turn the water on, it can shoot a long way across the kitchen. And you know, is that messy? Yes. Is it a memory? Oh, you better believe it. Because once you get me, what's the rule? You got to get even. So I'll get the whole water pitcher out of the fridge and we, now we got to get the mop out. And you know what we've done? We didn't have to have the internet, but we just had a blast as a family. We did this when they were small. Get a chair over there and let me and you wash the dishes because you're the man. It's only seven, but you can help me do the dishes. You rinse them. Daddy will hand it to you and you rinse them. I've done more counseling at the kitchen sink. Talked about girls and purity. What some kids said on the basketball court and they didn't know what it meant. Guys and girls and ladies and gentlemen, God's on your side. Don't let the internet destroy your home. It's time to go. You've been a good audience. Any questions or comments before I say prayer and we have a, a conclusion, question or comment? My, my wife was a school teacher and she'd say, questions or comments or otherwise snide remarks? <laughs> All right, pastor, I'm going to pray.